Well, <clears throat> what can I do to uh, even come halfway up to the expectations of this group? Uh, I once did teach. And, uh, <laughs> and I think maybe it could still happen again. <laughs> but I enjoy the fact that I'm not meeting classes every week. Um, this is a great relief, isn't it, not to be doing that? Huh? Some of you are teachers. teachers. Uh, we've always thought that it would be nice to get to this point, but now I've got to cope with a terrible problem of my books. <laughs> <laughs> the office I've had in the CLA uh, for the last more than 10 years, more than a decade, uh, had close to 3,000 books in it. But many of them were in boxes because I couldn't, from, from the old office in Shaw, <coughs> because there just simply wasn't room to shelve them anywhere. So now I am having to face the music. <laughs> and, and it's not pretty. Because it includes, as well, many boxes of files and papers. And uh, I know the first box of papers, I thought, well, I can throw this box out. Recycle, recycle. Top four papers were honors papers. Oh, God, I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, not yours yet. <laughs> but uh, uh, I am trying to recover from that. And uh, I'm not, not making as much progress as I should simply because I am uh, giving a few talks along the way. I spoke to the legal... Uh, department, the lawyers at State Farm last week, and I have another major occasion on the 30th. And we're, I wonder if Lisa is here, <laughs> promising something for April. Yes, <laughs> and uh, and I'm uh, discovering that it is fun to research these events. But how do you research this one? Uh, <laughs> I have tried to think of some different directions we could go. But one of the things I have discovered in going to a few reunions myself is that one of the advantages of going to a reunion is thinking historically. You are part of a generation. However, you are parts of several generations, that I think, as I look for other people with air of a certain hue. And I think that uh, that discovery is an important one in one's life uh, experience to see what history means in that respect. Um, I remember the cold, rainy days in March of 1966 in which I interviewed here with President Berthoff. How many of you remember President Berthoff? See, it's still here. And um, I also remember being assigned a bunk in the basement of Ferguson with heating pipes clanging overhead and men with jackhammers waking me up much earlier in the morning than I wanted to because they were doing a project outside of Ferguson and uh, digging up concrete or asphalt or something. <laughs> and I thought that this is an ancient tradition, maybe. <laughs> this is what in the medieval period was called trial by ordeal <laughs> to see whether you could make it when you were here. I decided Wesleyan was serious about testing recruits. But it was a university with serious ambition to build and achieve distinction as a liberal arts university. It wasn't there yet, but it had possibilities. And I remember on a rainy afternoon crossing Main Street to a 
a phone booth on the other side in front of the drugstore, which, uh, from which I called my wife to tell her, I think this is it. <laughs> we can live here. There will be life here. And uh, one of the things you find when you go to a graduation reunion is that uh, you have a sense of the choices you made. You made choices. And these choices determine partly who you are. And of course, you made them partly because of who you were. But this is a very, very interesting occasion. And it's deeply gratifying to see so many of you here. You came to the university, I suspect, because you were ready for a challenge. Perhaps not knowing what that challenge w would be, but uh, you were interested but not sure what to study. You were very interested in each other, but you had no cell phones. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this, this is an, so you, you, you are the generation that made the transition uh, that we're talking about. And uh, I don't remember when they arrived, but I do recall that after a class at some point, I was walking perhaps to the center for coffee and hearing a student saying, no, mom, I don't need that. I'm OK. I went to class, and uh, I thought, oh, mom can check up on you with a cell phone. <laughs> this, is, this is the other side of it that I hadn't fully appreciated, but it's there. We hadn't yet reached the age that I have typified, typified as the iPhone age, which is an age of total connectivity and um, almost total receptivity. When people are slow to respond to emails, but quick to almost uh, to pick up messages and Twitter back. Uh -huh. I found that some of my emails got overlooked in the last year or two, uh, and I realized I should have Twittered probably. Um, um, slowly, I discovered this. Does this mean that historians of the future will have to wade through millions of tweets? Um, I hope not. But I'm skeptical, too, about the buildup of electronic uh, banks in the clouds. Because it's always been true that in history there are more sources than any of us can read. And uh, you have to be selective. You don't want to have to drink out of the fire hose uh, of the gush of things that are unfiltered and uh, may not be worth your time. So, but even printed sources have to be carefully defined. After all, there are mountains of books like the nearly 3,000 that the provost has kindly let me examine and try to winnow out in an empty classroom in Shaw. <laughs> but Shaw, of course, was my habitat for years. So I feel quite at home there. That's probably dangerous. <laughs> uh, recently, I've been investigating the experience of the Freedmen's Bureau after the Civil War, what to do with the ex-slaves, how to see that they make a transition to becoming citizens when so few people wanted them to be citizens. Uh, this is a very interesting period in our history. <coughs> I found an impressive book, one of a series that I was looking at just the other day, because it, but it has over 900 pages of text. There's a book that's a mountain in itself, but it's awfully well edited. <coughs> and uh, that's not the end. The National Archives is now making available additional letters, contracts, reports, of the Freedmen's Bureau on microfilm. 
This is, and this is being made available to us in 13 regional offices where there are literally hundreds of reels of microfilm from the Freedmen's Bureau and the experience. Now, this is, they're just trying to kill historians, I think, <laughs> with this burden of evidence. We're going to be drowning in history, I think. But this is a culture that does not particularly have appreciation for historical perspective and historical attitudes. They have no idea how long Medicare has been a part of our culture. They have no idea even what it is. I've just found out. <laughs> <laughs> but I wonder how are we going to succeed in planting the stethoscope of history in these mountains of evidence we have to approach it with skepticism one of the first hallmarks of the historian and uh, we have to approach, approach it with some ability to decide what's important, what are we looking for, do we have the right questions to ask. And uh, in addition to all of these sources, I have a book that one of my graduate professors at Vanderbilt wrote when he found in Massachusetts the letters home from two Quaker sisters who had left Massachusetts to come to the South to teach in schools for the freedmen. The freedmen had a passionate interest in their history and in the Bible, and they wanted literacy in the worst way. Some old men wanted to learn how to read the Bible for themselves. They'd never been allowed to. And uh, it's fascinating how much of a, uh, how strong the search was for literacy. I wish the present generation had a similar commitment because literacy turns out to be such a powerful tool. It's one that everybody from the inner city, inner city to the outer suburbs should master. But now we live, uncomfortably, in an accelerating age of change. That leaves us wondering where the United States is taking us. From the mid-1960s with civil rights movement moving toward black power and black nationalism to urban riots, the Vietnam War, the war on poverty, the Economic Opportunity Act of 1964, and the assassinations of major public leaders, from President John F. Kennedy, to Martin Luther King, to Malcolm X, to presidential candidate Robert Kennedy. It appeared that we were coming apart. When we saw it happening in the third world, we always called such a place a banana republic. With, with no sense of appreciation at all. Now it was us. We've begun to pride ourselves, however, in being an exceptional people, an exceptional nation. This is not something that I welcome. This seems to be an outgrowth of a sense of the divine mission the Puritans had when they launched their errand into the wilderness in New England. The many Protestant religious believers seemed to carry this mission on in the 19th century as they sought to turn the United States into a Protestant Christian nation. It's a mission which appeals also to the nativists among us who to this day want to make it more difficult, especially for Spanish-speaking immigrants who historically have brought the Roman Catholic Church with them to be citizens of this nation. Surely there's a racial element to this effort to reduce their political weight by passing laws restricting certain kinds of voting procedures that will make it more difficult. 
there's such a low incidence of voter fraud in this country that such efforts seem to me to be entirely disingenuous. This is not the kind of exceptionalism we mean to promote. And Vladimir Putin, president of Russia, tried to set us straight on this while he was insulting us. Uh, <laughs> and tried describing, saying that policy is what makes America different. This is the basis of our exceptionalism. He said it's extremely dangerous to encourage people to see themselves as exceptional, whatever the motivation. There are big countries and small countries, rich and poor countries, those with long democratic traditions, those still finding their way to democracy, he said. Their policies differ too. We are all different, he said. And this was the killer line. But when we ask for the Lord's blessings, we must not forget that God created us equal. Pretty good. Probably written by his foreign minister, I suspect. He's <laughs> much more literate than he. He used our own declaration of independence against our boast of exceptionalism. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Now, as we present ourselves as exceptional, we are, in a significant way, elevating ourselves above others. This we are claiming. We have enough inequality without going there. But some of these values created equal, endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. These things are getting harder to pursue for all the citizens. These values are also at the foundation of our democracy, in which we are now seeing one of the most serious challenges to its values that we've experienced in our lives. And I, of course, from my own experience, have to point to things that seem to me to be threatening us. That's the inequality we're now experiencing. It would be argued that our internal problems, it could be argued our internal problems and disagreements are more threatening than the external threats we face, even though those threats may sometimes be very serious. The Occupy movement is the most obvious popular resistance to inequality that we've seen. But people don't seem to realize how serious it is. <clears throat> if those higher up can be reined in, one recent proposal is that they should be reined in to the extent that their pay should not be more than 100, per, than 100 times the pay of their lowest paid employee an interesting way of approaching this. A hundred times more than the pay of their lowest employee when some of them are up to four and five hundred times the pay of their lowest employees. America has always prided itself on not having a class system and yet having a class system. <laughs> Partly that's because as a society we've always been focused on upward mobility. Our belief in it is so strong that we overlook the fact that downward mobility is just as common and more threatening. And in our recent recession, uh, it was a cause not just of quite a disappointment, but a cause of fear. People losing the foothold they had on the ladder of ascent. Our belief is that among uh, that we have we, we're still have, trying to cope with this, but at the same time, among the poor, there's no need to argue about it. It's real, and it's present, and it's threatening. In the realms of Congress, they are so dismissive of the need in this country, they cut millions in food stamps from the recent farm bill passed in Congress, and. 
you know how many times that uh, poor mothers and children were are suffering from that. Because they seem to have no qualms about subjecting the poor to even deeper poverty while mouthing the myths about the poor. That they're looking for a hammock, looking for a easy way through life. What's so easy on uh, these marginal incomes that barely keep food on a table? In fact, frequently it's not there. But they, many of them, of course, are women who are trying to sustain a healthy life for themselves and their children. All of this goes with our boasts about the superiority of our democratic system, though how this can be maintained with a straight face with the present very public conflicts in Congress and with the president, I don't know. In fact, I'm totally fed up with the sheer boastfulness of our leaders, exclaiming to the world, we are a leading democratic nation, more than that, the greatest nation, the richest nation on earth. Do we really enjoy such boastfulness in our neighbors? or in our lives, want to be told that this is the case. There does not seem to me to be a shred of modesty left in America. Does America today, October 12, 2013, so enjoy people who boast like this that we want to broadcast it to the world? Does this make friends? Does this make allies? enemies. This reminds me of a former fine political science professor at Yale by the name of Dahl who wrote a book entitled How Democratic is the United States Constitution? And he found many shortcomings there. His analysis undermines many of our suppositions and claims. As a result, I've long believed that sometime in the present century we're going to have a constitutional crisis based on the inequities in our political system. And I'm afraid I'm going to have to hand this one on to you through the next generation. It's obvious when you realize how some of the smallest states, especially in the Northwest, have populations that are quite small. But two senators each who equal the representation of California in the United States Senate, whether it's Wyoming or North or South Dakota or something. Each one of them has the same weight as California. The present crisis over our budget and debt ceiling, it's clear that the majority d does not rule. A quaint memory of how a democratic system is supposed to work. Uh, Richard Rosenfeld has argued that in the modern Senate, the 26 smallest states with 18% of the nation's population have a majority in the Senate and can prevent any measures becoming law to which they object. The consequence is then that the nine largest states which contain a majority of the American population are represented by the senators from the 18 smallest states. The founding fathers didn't foresee how the population would be distributed. A majority of the states does not represent a majority of the people. So early childhood education, policies on oil pipelines, the amount of carbon released into the atmosphere, how much money the richest can spend on election of members to Congress or the presidency, all of these issues may be decided and probably will be and are being by a major minority of the people especially considering the impact of the Electoral College. Roosevelt points out that the ratification of the nomination of Justice Clarence Thomas to the Supreme Court succeeded by a four-vote margin, while the senators who voted against him represented seven million more people than those who voted for him. These problems, uh, he picked a particularly uh, conspicuous example, of course, these problems obviously multiply with the decisions of the Senate. And we have other questions on our plates. We have the issue of how we fund education. 
I went to college with veterans of the World War II generation. Many of them were getting going to college as the first people in their families ever to go to college. And they were delighted with the opportunity. And don't try to haze them as freshmen. <laughs> it was fun. I didn't want to be either, and so I joined them. <laughs> but I, and I, I had worked as a dishwasher with the Navy in a college program while I was in high school, so I had some acquaintance with the way it worked. But the GI Bill launched so many into a career of higher education. It was marvelous. And look at the state of our education today with states failing to, to fund adequately their public educational institutions. They're trying to spawn a whole new level of community colleges, which are badly needed. But at the same time, the amount of back support, back pay they owe, for, for instance, the University of Illinois is appalling. It's over $500 million the last I heard. And of course, the pension system is crowding them. So we're not really committed to such support. Just a few years ago, I was reading in the Chronicle of Higher Education that the people at the University of South Carolina were disgusted with the support they got from the uh, legislature in South Carolina because it was, had gone down so far, it was something like 10% of their budget, somewhere near where the church supports its colleges these days, churches. Um, but they were threatening to take the University of South Carolina private. They said they could raise more money if they were a private university than if they were supported by the state. And I suspect some others have thought, had those thoughts, too. We are not as committed. And, we, uh, and the, there needs to be major support for student scholarships. Illinois Wesleyan is being stressed right now with this need, with the incoming class this year. It's, a, it's, it's an important need that uh, that all of us, I think, should respond to. I wish that uh, we had more endowment at a time like that, but um, for failing that, we, we need to be uh, out soliciting support for students because there just isn't the support for students in families that cannot afford, perhaps they can't afford loans and uh, moving the loans into the public system has been a very good idea, I think. This is an investment in our future that is terribly important. But uh, just the same moment, people are doubting whether a college education is really what you need. You, know, you should perhaps reconsider your plan. Go to a technical school or something, get some, get some immediate boost, which it may be. But the difference is that people with a liberal arts education have, I, th are, think, I think, a little more nimble in finding another way to go if they, if they get cut from the job force and uh, their skills are still desirable. I remember the first history seminar I taught here. One of my students, I was totally flum flummoxed, one of my students went with uh, one of the air major airlines. One w went with National Cash Register, which existed in those days as a separate entity. One went with something like Xerox, I think. And I thought, 
These are history makers going to these places. Well, of course, they're smart. They, they can read and write very well, hopefully, maybe better in the future. And uh, we'll see where they go. They may have careers in parts of the business world that nobody understands. I know the New York Times just featured a, a, a uh, leader in a corporation who searches for people with very good personalities. They're outgoing, they're cheerful, they're good at relating to people. And uh, those skills, he thinks, are just as important, or possibly more so, than technical skills in some of their jobs. Um, they all have to know their way around the internet, perhaps, but uh, people can find that way if they need it. And uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by this. I also ran into a couple of other stories in the process about what happens as they, re as they rep uh, respond to the needs of the workplace. And they call it, they say that research in the endangered liberal arts subjects are subjects of recommendations from Capitol Hill. I don't want to hear any recommendations from Capitol Hill <laughs> on what, what we should study. They have to spend at least four hours every day raising money. I'm not sure they even understand the legislation they're voting on, let alone the skills needed in a highly skilled society. And some of them thought that uh, maybe people who majored in English and anthropology, I'm sure they would include history in this, just they're misguided. They need to have more practical, more employable skills than that. Oh, sure they know. Almost nothing. <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, we have a job to do here, to dig in and to try to support the kind of liberal education that Wesleyan has always struggled to maintain. And it's interesting because we have some of the characteristics of, of schools that go beyond the liberal arts, whether it's in drama or nursing or in business. And all of these things make this a good meeting place for people going in different directions. And I have always admired that even though I remember counseling with nursing students during the Vietnam War who were struggling because to get the education they needed, they needed to get a government scholarship, really, support. But they didn't want to support the Vietnam War. They wanted to take care of sick people, even wounded people. But they hated to be under the Department of the Army to do it. And I remember many hours spent talking with them about this. And it's simply very difficult to find a way out. But uh, they did somehow. And they needed that, fund, that government funding they wanted to pursue the mission of healing. Well, there are plenty of places where this can happen, but the liberal arts university is one of the very best places for it to happen. I, uh, it's interesting, a study at Harvard showed that while in 1954, 36% majored in the humanities, in 2012, 20% of their undergraduates did. Maybe students have over-interpreted the, the messages of the president because there are plenty of philosophical 
and even religious issues in what choices they have to make about career and lifestyle and other matters in the world. One of the hardest things to accept is the people that refuse to accept scientific evidence. <laughs> what do we do with them? Um, what, can, what, what uh, alternative is there? That, that's, there's not an alternative in universe for these people to live in. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, we, we're in trouble. Well, I think I think this might be a good chance for you to ask any questions that you may have here. Uh, this is a uh, something I'd be glad to try. Yes. I believe it was Franklin Eisenhower in one of his farewell speeches uh, touched upon or asked upon the subject of uh, we need to worry about the rise of fascism or mm -hmm. uh, Nazism or outside mm -hmm. threats threat on the United States. And he replied, no, we have to worry about the uh, inner. Mm -hmm. Uh, the military-industrial complex, right? <laughs> yeah. Is that what is happening today? I think so. I think our society is being militarized. And it's being militarized partly by the way in which we uh, pursue the business of war by volunteers instead of by draft. All of us wanted to get out of the draft. <laughs> That's a universal feeling. But we've lost the sense of citizenship, citizen army. And it's curious to me that one of the dimensions of this is that the public has taken to calling all of these soldiers heroes. Heroes just to belong, to, to wear the uniform, makes you a hero. Really? World War II soldiers refused to talk about themselves as heroes. They were doing a job. Their country had called upon them. They were willing to run the risk. I remember one of my cousins was in the ordinance repairing vehicles, tanks, various things that needed repair. He was in North Africa, and there was a German fighter plane that strafed him, tried to kill him. But the anti-aircraft battery nearby got him. He survived the loss of his plane. But my cousin then had to drive him back to headquarters to, to be incarcerated. And he caught, he, the whole way back, he was thinking of the irony of the fact that here he was driving the man who had tried to kill him back to the headquarters and, and to incarcerate him. He didn't consider it heroic at all. It was an incident in the war. And then he was transferred into Italy to fight the way up through Italy. And this was all doing what the general said you should do. But the combination of this with the with corporate interests, how many atomic bombs have we made? Who were we going to use them against? Did we have thousands? Who's, who, who did they think wanted to pay for that many? If they wanted to pay for any at all. This is now we got the problem of what do we do with old atomic weapons? And, and we stand on our high moral authority because we're not only a rich nation, but we're a good nation. 
course, we're the only one in human history that has used the atomic bomb against the civilian population. And uh, that's a discomforting thought. I like to entertain some discomforting thoughts. We're too comfortable in the way we think about ourselves. And uh, this is, and we, at the same time, we've got nuclear power to worry about. And so do the Japanese. So we have plenty of problems here, but we have lots of corporate interests along with the military problems. And uh, when it comes up, comes time to refund, what are they worried about now? The shutdown of government, that it will impair our military readiness. It's hard to believe. Yeah. Well, when you, when you came here in 1966 and sat down with Lloyd Bertolt, uh, you made a choice. You were saying we all made our historical choices. <laughs> that's, that's really so much the case. Uh oh. So I'm, I'm interested in what kept you going all these years. <laughs> um, many of us have taught for 30 years and we can't quite believe it. Mm -hmm. But you taught, you mentored, you did scholarship, you were a public intellectual of the the best type for 47 years. How did you keep going? <laughs> uh, uh, need to support a family, too. <laughs> uh, uh, and the fact that I really had a job I liked doing. I always said that I would like to have a job that was good enough that I would want to do it even if I didn't get paid. And sometimes it wasn't too much of that. <laughs> but, uh, but still, uh, let's not push that too far. Uh, that was gratifying. People like you made it gratifying. My students. And, and your turmoils. I still remember, I was a much younger professor, being called at two in the morning by one of my uh, students I knew got arrested by the normal police. Uh, so I had to go, I went, got some clothes on and went to the jail and bailed him out. But uh, yeah, I don't normally have those problems, but, <laughs> <laughs> but I, we are not really in loco parentis, we were getting away from that. When I was a young professor, the students didn't want the university to be their parent. I remember arguing for that on the floor of the faculty in some sense at times. I still remember uh, in those days the faculty met in McPherson. <laughs> nice bank seats like this, but more of them an argument as to whether there ought to be an Argus reporter attending faculty meetings. <laughs> Harvey Boynton never stopped thanking me for the fact that I spoke rather passionately in favor of that. But it was a, a somewhat unpopular subject at first, and of course a lot of history majors were Argus editors <laughs> and staffers. <laughs> But that's only something I thought of later. <laughs> I only knew it later, probably. But one of the distinguished department heads in the faculty in the humanities area got up and stomped out after that vote. And uh, I, uh, I kind of enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> I won. Mm. Yeah. I think when I took your class in the 60s, uh, sometime right at the beginning of the emphasis on the fact, being on the Vietnam War, that you wouldn't get the true story from our media, but now the influence of the media on all of this stuff that's going on, the way they do not report, mm -hmm. there uh, there is corporate influence as another, so they report, um, so Fox News is the biggest joke, but some of the other ones, that they, <laughs> and then everyone's chittering on the internet and just, mm -hmm. Such vast amounts of completely 
incorrect information. Yeah, or 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 incomplete information. Yeah, they, leave of, out, yeah. they leave out so much. Mm -hmm. it's so true. And of course, the government does a lot to restrict the amount that's released too. Uh, they don't trust us to know all these things. But uh, foreign affairs is an area where I think the citizen is often rather well informed. Partly because so many people came here from somewhere else. <laughs> and they know the languages. What an idiot thing it was to do to fight a war in Asia when you don't know the language of the country. They might have they might have known it in Europe <coughs> and had translators. But since I'd spent a year in Afghanistan when I was in college, I really had a new insight into Asian culture, which I felt was sadly needed. I had been in India, Afghanistan. I came home with old Mihan tour bus through Iran, and a desert taxi to uh, Iraq and Syria, Lebanon. And uh, I had a little taste of something very different. And I remember in Jerusalem, as I was leaving, going on, going back to Beirut, that I saw all these tents out in the desert. And I said, what's going on? What's going on this? And of course, they were Arabs who had been interned in the desert, displaced people. And I said to my traveling companion, that's going to be a hell of a problem in 20 years. <laughs> and uh, that's the next war brewing. You, know, you can't do that to people and expect to get good results out of it. So, when I came back here, I did study Middle Eastern studies, but I couldn't find any place to study Arabic. I gave one scholarship to study Arabic once, and I tried to compete for it. And it went to the Secretary of the Middle East Association in Washington, D.C. So I never had a shot. <laughs> but uh, all I had was a few of my ragged phrases and pushed to from my time in Kabul and uh, my experience driving and, and seeing people in Afghanistan. The natives standing around a fire cooking a little pot of stuff at one of the places on, on the road to Meshed. I actually got out a joke in, in, Af in their language. And uh, it was such fun. And they were so happy. They were, they were standing in their bare feet in snow when I was talking with them. Because they didn't have adequate shoes. But they were used to not having adequate shoes. And I thought, these people are so like us. What, what possibilities are there for the future? And uh, you got to wonder why we didn't take those chances. Right now, <laughs> After all these years, the United States has still not guaranteed a 24-hour power supply to the city of Kabul. You can't go there, you can't keep the lights going for 24 hours. It's not there. But why not? Are we trying to win acceptance, respect, a little gratitude from these people? Or do we just go in to shoot up a place? This is, this is pathetic. And I must say that as I stopped at various embassies and so forth along the way or uh, con to talk to consuls, it was very interesting. I think they wanted to do more, but their programs didn't call for much more. I was really disappointed with that. I remember a guy who was a lower desk uh, employee at American Embassy. He was a philosophy graduate from the University of Kansas who 
somehow found his way into this business. And uh, that encouraged me for a while. I thought, maybe I could join this group. And then I realized, you know, my father warned me, you got to have money if you're going to go there. They don't pay you adequately to do what you do. But we don't have much respect sometimes for our own government tasks. Right now, the State Department is consistently bypassed to deal with things that we deal with through the military. We don't respect our secretaries of state much. We don't give them adequate staff and, and backup research and, and, and the rest. Um, we aren't waging peace. We're just waging war. And uh, the fact that I can't be a 100% pacifist uh, makes me still yearn for a time when we could turn some of our priorities around. And it's maybe you and some of your kids who may have to have that kind of job. But we need to do it. We haven't reached anywhere near our potential. And it's partly for the shallow thinking of the political class that doesn't realize the potential that we have as a country. I, I just loved one of my father's students in Kabul. It was a, it was a secondary, it was a lycée level school, uh, like a high school, but they taught calculus in Kabul. It's kind of interesting. He came out, he was graduating, and uh, he, might, he did sort of want to go to the United States. But first, he wanted to go to Paris and meet some of these existentialist philosophers. He wanted to meet Jean Paul Sartre in the worst way. Ashraf Gobar was his name. Fantastic kid with great potential. I haven't any idea where he is, but there, there are surprising eruptions when you ex expose people to great ideas and great literature and great possibilities of service. And these can happen. Boo! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I've had a long time. <laughs>